Thank you, worship team. Um, you know what Egypt is, don't you? <laughs> You've been there. Uh, maybe you're there today. Uh, Egypt does kind of come and go in our lives, and uh, Egypt is uh, just the oppression of the world, the oppression of, of so many things in our lives that can get too big for us. Sometimes uh, it, it's not anything we've done. Uh, sometimes it's something we have done. But boy, if you're there, the promise of God is uh, deliverance. And as we move into chapter 5 today, uh, on into chapter 5 on the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to get to some very practical issues, uh, everyday life things. And, and as I was singing that song, I was realizing uh, that pr- the, certainly the one today, but, but really all of the rest of these that we're going to be looking at probably for the next four to five weeks are the things that keep us in Egypt. (laughs) Uh, The reason why so many people are bound up and the reason why so many people uh, reside uh, in in their bondage and don't find the release that God has for them is that they continue to live in in the, the things that will keep them in bondage. And uh, I don't think there's anything that keeps us in bondage any more than uh, what we're going to be talking about today. And so uh, as we get into this again, just a reminder, we're listening in uh, along with the disciples who listened in. We're we're leaning in and listening to Jesus as He's giving us some important things about the kingdom of God. And living this way uh, will allow you to be salt and light in your relationships that you have in life. One of the reasons that God brought the people out of Egypt is that He wanted them to be be salt and light to the world. God didn't just choose the nation of Israel just so that they could be the chosen people. He chose them so that they could be a light to the world, that they would flavor the world. And uh, they had a lot of ups and downs in that. But one of the things that we see all through the Scripture is that God is continually calling them back to Him. Now this um, passage of Scripture again today, uh, I think it is one of the more difficult things that we ever come to grips with, uh, if we're really going to live against the grain. It's very difficult because we really don't get a lot of help from our culture. We don't get a lot of help from politics. We don't get a lot of help from just about any place in our lives in the modeling of this. And this is why it's important that we learn God's way to resolve conflict. Anybody been in conflict before? All right. How many of you have been in conflict this week? (laughs) How about this morning? Hopefully not the last five minutes when you walked into church, okay? Uh, conflict is, is a part of life, isn't it? And, and what it does is that it can bring uh, things out of our lives that will certainly create bondage and not the freedom that God wants. Now, as we move into this uh, today and we talk about resolving conflict, uh, it, it's always important for me whenever I read a passage of Scripture to know, particularly if it's the words of Jesus, that Jesus knew what was coming. He he knew what was ahead for these people again who were listening in and, and, and gleaning the things of the kingdom. And as He is giving them a new way to live, something very different from the way that they had lived their lives up to this point, Jesus knew what they were going to face as they went to this future living in this new kingdom of salvation that he was going to bring with his death and his resurrection. Uh, He knew that ahead was going to be a lot of miracles. (laughs) Don't you think it would have been great to have walked with Jesus? My goodness, and to see all the things that he did, how wonderful it must have been then even after he was resurrected from the dead and and went to be with the Father where he now prays and intercedes on our behalf all of the time uh, to experience the miracles of those very first Christians. Think about the, the communities that were formed and how they grew and how they burst out from Jerusalem and how in one day 3,000 people came to the Lord and, and they just began to saturate everything that was going on. They moved around the Mediterranean Sea. And in a short period of time, probably just a generation or a little bit more, Christianity was blooming and blossoming all over the world. 
Jesus knew that this was ahead for these leaders. He knew that, that they themselves were going to be laying hands on people and healing them. That they, they themselves were going to be uh, persecuted and sitting in prison and God would just miraculously make the guards go to sleep, create an earthquake. Uh, my favorite story is the people who were praying for, for, uh, for uh, Peter. Uh, and 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 they were he was in the jail and God released him while they were praying <laughs> and he went to the house where the people were praying and he knocked on the door and a little kid came to the door <laughs> and Peter said hey it's me go tell everybody I'm here <laughs> and the little boy went in and told all the people that were there that Peter was at the door and they said well he can't be at the door because we're praying for him to be released that's about the way our faith is sometimes, isn't it? We're praying and we're praying and we're praying for things. And right there, God has answers for us. But he knew that all of these faith-building, powerful things were going to be happening in the lives of these people. But he also knew that some other things were going to be happening. It wasn't going to be long in this beautiful church that God was creating, this body of Christ, these people who were following him, that they were inevitably going to get into conflict. Now I ask you today, uh, have you ever been in conflict with somebody? And I'm just guessing that you've never been in conflict with another Christian. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we know that's not true either, do we? Anytime you get people together, sometimes you're going to have conflict. People are going to do something. Somebody's going to do something, and somebody doesn't understand it. And before long, we find out that, that even when it comes to people in the church, there is sometimes conflict. Now, I'm sure that no marriage here ever has conflict in it. Amen? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I think sometimes marriage is made for conflict if we're not careful. Uh, but the reality is, is, is that Jesus knew as these disciples were listening in that conflict was going to come into their lives. The first thing that happened is, do you need to be circumcised or not? And people were at their wits end arguing together about the answer to that. There were problems between the rich and the poor. There were problems about ethnic prejudices. The Jews were over here and the Gentiles were over here and this beautiful, wonderful church was growing and moving forward and yet underneath there were all of these tensions going on. How are you going to minister to the poor in the community was one of the big ones that you see in Acts, I believe, chapter 6 or 7. And they had to figure those things out together under the leadership of God's Holy Spirit. There were even conflicts among the disciples, the people who were closest to God. Peter and Paul got into it one day uh, about how close Peter was getting back to the, to the Pharisees and people that Paul didn't believe he should be associating with. There was Paul and Barnabas. They disagreed on which direction they needed to go in their missionary journeys. There were even people who were choosing upside. Do you remember that verse? It said, some people say, I'm of Paul. And some people say, I'm of Apollos. And it was creating conflict within the church. This is just the nature, if we're not careful, of what we do even as Christians. So Jesus, knowing all of this, he says, oh, in this area, you've got to learn to live against the grain. You, you, you got to be like that fish in the river where you turn around, and even though you're swimming upstream, even though you're swimming in a direction that most people are not going, you have to learn how to live in a different way when it comes to how we deal with conflict in our lives. So let's dig into it this morning. Uh, now, this is going to be challenging. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. All right, it's good news, it's wonderful news. But boy, it, it, it's, it's a lot sometimes that we have to face when we look at this particular topic. Verse 21 says this, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to the judgment. <laughs> now that's one of those statements, well, duh. 
Yeah, we, we shouldn't murder, we shouldn't kill people, we shouldn't do that, and if you do, uh, th- there has to be judgment for that. And so the Word of God is very clear when it comes to harming other people. The Scripture says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, exactly what it says here, that we are not to murder someone else. Now, people have written books and books through the centuries about, well, can you fight a war? What about the... Let's don't get into all of that today, because really what Jesus is talking about here, and we'll talk about this in just a minute, is not when we have to face sin, okay? Because there's a certain way that we have to deal sometimes when people are hurting other people because of sin and because of abuse. But what we're talking about here is just the inevitable things in our marriages, with our children, with our co-workers, within our church, wherever it is, when we find ourselves at odds with each other. Well, the Scripture said, do not murder. Well, the oral law, the scribes and the Pharisees, down through the decades, then into the centuries, began to comment and define situations where anger and retaliation and even killing were justified. And what they did is, unfortunately, more often than not, is they accepted the ways of the world. The ways of the world were referred to as the lex talionis. That's a big Latin phrase. It just simply means a tit for a tat. A tit for a tat means that you can retaliate when somebody does something to you in kind. Now, when you talk to most people in the world, that's kind of the way they view conflict. You know, if somebody walks up and they, and they begin to attack me, then I'm going to attack them back. I'm not just going to defend myself, but I'm going to put them down. When somebody steals something from us, we say, well, they stole something from me, I'm going to take something back from them. And what happens is we get into this justifying what we do in our lives, particularly when it comes to conflict. The Lex Talionis said you're allowed to retaliate when you are wronged as long as it is proportional and in kind. But now Jesus is going to tell us something very different here. (laughs) He is going to say you've got to learn to deal with the poison in your heart that anger can bring to your life. How many of you have had anger poison your heart. (laughs) Boy, I know I have. It's easy to do. Somebody hurts you. And what happens is that you, you, you get these strong feelings, and the Scripture says, Jesus is going to tell us here, that if we don't learn how to deal with that properly, anger has a process. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Now, just a caveat here, this is not excusing sin and abuse. Anywhere where sin is present and people are doing it and they're calling it something different, particularly with God's people, has got to be called out. We can't just let sin happen and happen and happen because it not only hurts the person who's doing it, but it hurts everybody around them. And so while we are covered by grace and whenever there is repentance and there is sorrow, there always needs to be forgiveness and restoration within the church. But sometimes sin is so evil and so vile and it never stops that the Scripture is clear that often we have to deal with it. It's never okay to hurt somebody else. When people just come in, I, I, I've seen not a lot, but I've seen people come in and just with their attitudes, with their, the things that they do, they just ravage people's lives. Those things have to be dealt with, so that's not what we're talking about here. But even though those things exist, and there has to be righteous anger and righteous action when things like that happen, Jesus is telling us that so often, though, in our lives, it's not about morality. It's really not about right or wrong. It's just about the fact that you don't agree with somebody else. And somebody else doesn't agree with you. And when that happens, it is so important. If the kingdom of God is going to continue to move forward, it is so important that we learn how to deal with the poison that anger 
can bring to our lives. Now, what is that process? I want to share it with you this morning here in verse 32. It details it out, and and I'll go through some of the, the words that we're going to look at here this morning. Verse 22 says this, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to the judgment. Anybody ever been angry with your brother or your sister in Christ? Wow. Man, does that mean all of us have to be judged? We'll talk about that in just a minute. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. That means the, the big court, the supreme court in the society there. But anyone who says you are a fool to another person will be in danger of the fires of hell. Now that's pretty serious. If Jesus brings hell into this, how we deal with conflict and anger in our life is very, very important. Now let's look at some of these words this morning. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to the judgment. Now, there were commonly two words that were translated for anger, all right, in the, in the New Testament. The first word was called thumos, all right? Thumos is explosive anger, anger that blows up and then dies down. How many of you have ever done thumos before? <laughs> How many of you have done it this last week? <laughs> It's hard not to when somebody attacks you, when somebody hurts somebody that you love. When this is going on or when that's going on, what happens is things well up quickly in our lives and we go, wow! And then it kind of dies back down. Now that's one of the, the, of the ways that, that, that you can see anger being mentioned in the Bible. I like it to say it's kind of like a gas fireplace. <laughs> When, you, when maybe the gas thing's not working the way it's supposed to, and you ever had to do this way where you get the gas and you turn it on and you, and you go, Phew! what does it do? Phew! Man, it flares up, but then it kind of dies back down. Kind of like, how many of you still charcoal? All right. I got one of those gas thingamajiggers, all right? <laughs> but, but, but when I used to do charcoal, man, you put all of that stuff on it, all of the carrot, not kerosene, what do you call it? Lighter fluid, thank you. You put all that on there, and then you go, Phew. man, it blares up. That's thumos. That's the kind of anger that is represented by that word. Now, there's another word, and it's called orge. And this is anger that is nursed and kept alive. Now, I want you to think about that. The best place I could go to is an intensive care unit. What happens in an intensive care unit? Somebody's very sick, right? And, and everything is being done to keep the person alive. If they need to be, have somebody breathe for them, somebody to make their heart beat, whatever it is that needs to be done when you're in an intensive care unit, this person's life is being nursed along very, very meticulously and slowly. Now, that's orge. <laughs> Anger can get in our lives, can it? And when it gets in our lives, if we don't deal with it and do what God asks us to do, what do we begin to do? Well, it kind of dies down from the from the first explosion, but then we began to feed it. And then we began to kind of take care of it. And then we began to nurture it. And if we're not careful, before long, this anger just sits underneath the surface and it just seethes and seethes and seethes. Sometimes thumos can come out of orge. Have you ever, I'm sure you've never done this, but have you ever seen somebody? who they're just going along in their life and one little thing will happen that doesn't go right and all of a sudden this person will blow up and it seems very disproportionate to the little incident that just happened. You know why those things happen? It's because we nurse anger. 
And you see, when we nurse anger and when we let it remain and we, we give it life and we continue to feed it and we begin to say, I have a right to this anger, I have a right to feel this way, I'm not going to give it up, what happens is it just keeps going and going and sometimes all you need is a little spark and it will just explode over everybody in the general vicinity out of proportion reactions. Now, I want to read this again, all right? Verse 22 says this, I tell you that anyone who just blows up real quickly and then dies back down with his brother will be subject to the judgment. Raise your hand if you think the word here is thumos. All right? Well, let's read it this way. But I tell you that anyone who nurtures and harbors and keeps anger alive towards another brother or sister will be subject to the judgment. How many think it's orge that's used here? Okay, now look, you've got to vote. If you didn't vote the first time, you've got to vote the second time. How many of you think it's the first one? Explosive anger. How many of you think it's the second one? <laughs> it is the second one. Pretty obvious, isn't it, as we think about our spiritual lives. What messes up our relationships? Is it just because we go, all of a sudden? <laughs> Man, for 43 years, Gail and I would never have made it 43 years if we, got a, if we thought about divorce every time one of us went, brah! <laughs> Man, it, sometimes the anger pops up and we go, wow, and it's just there, and we, ooh, but it comes back down. It's not good to do that. It's not the right thing. But these things do happen in our lives. But I want to tell you what will kill a marriage, what will kill a friendship, what will kill a church, what will kill a workplace, what will harm people in the most profound ways are when anger is nursed and it is kept alive day after day after day. Now, what's... What you got to notice here is what are the consequences of that. If you live your life this way towards other people, it will lead to estrangement with other people. Because you see, when you're always angry, and people can see that, we think we hide it all the time, but people can see our anger whenever we're feeling it, and whether, whether it's just almost above the, the, the water level, but we try to keep it below. When we do that and then we pour it on other people, then judgment comes upon us and we become estranged with people who we are supposed to love and care about. Church, marriage, doesn't matter where it is. You see, this, this orge anger can harm your relationships with other people. But the thing about anger is it never stops there. Anger is like a ball rolling down a hill. And man, once it gets rolling, it is very hard to stop. And so Jesus says this. Now again, if you go further now and you begin to call your brother names, Raka was a very derogatory name that people called each other. Think of terrible things that we sometimes call each other in our, in our culture. One person calls somebody else this, and then they call an insult back. Whenever you get that far, this word is the language of contempt. Have you ever had contempt for somebody? You see, what happens is when we harbor anger, when we nurse it, when it blows up sometimes, then as we begin to have continued relationship with a person, we start having contempt for them. And we start thinking things about them that are not true. And we start attributing things to them that may be true or may not be true. But that anger begins to breed contempt. And this is why we have so much conflict in our world. This person doesn't like that person. This person doesn't like that person. And it goes on and on and on and on. And then finally, Jesus says, and you see, that, 
begins to affect our relationship with God. That's what taking it to the Sanhedrin meant. The Sanhedrin made judgments about people's relationship with God. And you see, if you let your anger cause you to have contempt toward other people, it will affect your spiritual life. I promise you it will. It will hurt your heart and affect your relationship with God. Well, the final thing there, he says, anyone who calls someone a fool, and that is an extremely derogatory term. The word is moros. And it is anger that is beyond contempt, but it has gone to hatred. I hate you. I hope you've never let your anger get to that point in your life, but many people do, where they look at somebody and they hate that person. And that person, if they're not careful, begins to hate them back. And when you let your anger get to the point that you justify hatred towards other people, then the Scripture says you will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now that wakes me up. (laughs) That says to me that the process of anger is very, very important for us to stop it at its early stages. There is no way that you're never going to feel angry. You are going to feel angry. Things are going to happen and they're just going to make your blood boil and you're going to get frustrated about this and you're going to get frustrated about that and you're going to look and it seems like the source of that frustration is a particular person or maybe it's a group of people. It doesn't really matter what it is. But right at that particular point, here's what Jesus says that we need to do. How do you keep an undivided heart? How do you keep your heart where God wants it to be? Therefore, because of all this about anger and and its consequences, therefore, verse 23, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come back and offer your gift. It's really hard to put our relationships before anything else. (laughs) But we've got to learn to do that because God values relationships more than anything else. Why did he send his son to die so that we could have a relationship with him again? All this stuff was in the way. He sent Jesus to clear it all out so that we wouldn't have anything between God and us and our hearts. But you see, he died also so that there wouldn't constantly be all of these things that we can sometimes put in between ourselves and other people. Now, Jesus is talking about the temple sacrifice here, where people would go and offer a sacrifice for the things that maybe they didn't even know they did. Then they would have a time of confession and repentance, maybe restitution, reconciliation in their heart with God, with other people, and they would offer a sacrifice. And what does Jesus say? Before you do that... Before you go to church and do anything, before you have your devotions in the morning, before you go to church, before you write your tithe check, before you do anything else in your life spiritually, before you do anything, leave that right where it's at and go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your spiritual gift to God. Wow, it's really hard (laughs) to put relationships in that important of a place in our lives. But you see, this is is why God always talks about that if you're going to have a good marriage, you've got to have a unified marriage. Nobody has a perfect marriage, but marriages that work is where the husband and the wife are together. And whenever that breaks down... That's when problems can occur. And so Jesus is telling us here, relationships of all kinds, it is important. Remember where he said, don't let the sun go down on your anger? (laughs) Because what happens when the sun goes down on your anger is you wake up the next morning and it feels worse, doesn't it? 
It feels more powerful in your life. And so the Scripture is telling us here, make sure that the first things that you do in your spiritual life is that the best that lies in you be at peace with all people. How many of you have run into people that won't let you make peace with them? There's nothing you can do about that as far as lies within you. Be at peace with people in your life. And so he makes this last statement here, and he says, so settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way, while you're still in relationship with him, before everything breaks down. Or he may hand you over to a judge, and the judge may hand you over to an officer, and you might be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth. You'll not get out until you have paid every last penny. And you see, that's the end result of broken relationships, is there's always a cost to it. When settling differences in your life, it's always preferable to settle the difference than to win the argument. How many of you like to win arguments? I'm a great debater. I love to win arguments. But I've discovered that when I try to win an argument in my marriage, now I'm not going to take a shot at the females, okay? I'm thinking, <laughs> this is just the truth, all right? When I try to win an argument in my marriage, <laughs> it does not go well in my life. Who said amen? All right, I'm glad I'm there. All right, thank you, Brian. All right. <laughs> we, we all know that, don't we? That's true when wives try to pick things with their husbands. It never, ever turns out the way it's supposed to. How many of you have done this? How many of you have ever set it, set a, a laid on your pillow at night and you're in conflict with somebody and you create a scenario about how you're really going to show them? <laughs> All right, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> if they say this, I'm going to say that. And they're going to go, oh. But then they're going to try again. And I'm going to go, burr, 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 burr. And they're going to go, oh. You are, such a, you are so right. I am so wrong. That has never, ever happened in my life. Those scenarios never work out, do they? Because, you know, that's, we're, we have to learn to settle differences. And it must always be preferable to winning an argument. Now, I told you a few weeks ago about a man in my church who used to sit and just stare at me during the, during the sermon and everything. And I told you that water would well up in his eyes. And, and one day I got tired of feeling angry with him about why he would do that and why on the board every time I would say, well, let's try to do this, he would say just the opposite. And I went to him and I found out again that he had lost his son in a motorcycle accident. Only, only child he ever had. He was estranged and fighting with his son at the time, and bang, just like that, his son was gone. But in that time, I became a pastor to that man, and he became a friend to me. And boy, next thing I knew on the board, whenever I was trying to do something, he was all for it. We didn't do it for that reason, okay? But, but do you see what happens when we settle our differences? then the things in life that are important move forward. But I have to tell you, in that same church, I had a building and grounds chairman, fine man, loved the Lord. When I tell you about these things, this is not about, oh, I was such a great pastor to these horrible people. <laughs> he, he was a fine man. But he was very controlling about the building and grounds. I mean, it had to be done this way and that way, and nobody could say anything about the building and grounds without this guy giving approval. And we had two of the ugliest doors I've ever seen in my life that led into the sanctuary. The ugliest, chipped, they were horrible. And I began to tell him, we need to change those doors. And for some reason, I can't even remember why, he said, no, we don't need to change those doors. Well, one time he had a surgery and was gone for eight weeks, and guess what I did? <laughs> I changed the doors. You know, there were a few people that said, you know, that's good, Pastor. He, 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 you, somebody needed to stand up to him. Somebody, had, you know, you can make all these excuses. 
But when he came back, he was angry. And we, you ever, you ever watch Gary Coop the High Noon? <laughs> Walking out in the middle of the street. Boy, we were just ready, ready to fire. And sometimes when you're ready to fire, you do. And we both fired every bullet we had in our gun. Destroyed our relationship. Hurt my witness as a pastor in the church. He was so devastated, he just left the church. And I'll never forget that. Because God told me in my heart exactly what Jesus is telling these disciples. Settling differences is always preferable to winning an argument. Now, folks, again, hang with me on this. We're not talking about sin. We're not talking about things that have to be dealt with that God deals with sometimes very, very distinctly. But we're talking about the things that happen in our lives all the time. And suddenly they get bigger and they get bigger and they get bigger. There are spiritual consequences for those things in your relationship with God. There are spiritual consequences in the relationships that we have with each other, in our families, wherever it might be. It's a challenge, folks, to live against the grain. It's a challenge to swim upstream when all of the rest of the fish are going this way. But if we swim with the current, we will always be in carnal conflict with other people. It is inevitable in our lives. But if we swim against the current and the Spirit inhabits our lives and we begin to open our, our hearts to people that we are in conflict with and we swim against the current, we will find unity and harmony and peace with God Amen. and with other people as much as it lies within us. Again, not compromising, but just in our disagreements and our relationships. It is so important to settle our differences as God would ask us to. Wow, I, I, I'm so thankful for the freedom that this has given me over the years in my life. When I look back, there are relationships in my life I can't repair. I'm sure you've got some of those. <laughs> there are relationships in my life where uh, I did everything I could and, and nothing could make a difference. This man was one of those things. But as much as lies within me now in my life, the most important thing in my life is not to compromise, but to live in peace in the disagreements that I have with people in my life. And I can tell you this today. I can tell you this with a complete and clear conscience. I have no enemies in my life. And when somebody comes and they're an enemy with me, I do everything I can to make it right. I'll do restitution. I won't, it's, it's not that, that, that I'm just kowtowing, but it doesn't, it's not worth it to me anymore to be angry with somebody. It's not worth it to me anymore to be in constant conflict with people, whatever it may be. What is worth to me is to have a clean heart. Amen. And when I invited Jesus into my life, I have to be honest with you, for a long time I slammed a few of the doors in my, in my house and didn't let him in. And one of the last ones I let him into is the places, the little corners, the cubby holes that I was harboring resentment towards other people. I can tell you today that God has miraculously helped me with that and freed me in so many of my relationships. My hope is in your life that He will allow you to be free also. My last uh, instruction to you today is <laughs> we're God's people. We're the church. If we don't do it, who will? Do you think our political parties are going to help us with that this year in an election year? And I'm not saying that it's important how we vote. These are important things. I'm just saying nobody out there is going to live this way. But we have the opportunity to be salt and light in the way we live.